Talk about the transition from school to full-time software development. I think that the transition itself can be it can be kind of rough because it's a little bit of a, an abrupt change because I feel like you're used to you know working on school projects where you get instant feedback, you can immediately see your grade, and the requirements are generally pretty pretty clear uh, or or they should be you know as as based on whatever the the um, the written requirements are for that project. Um, and I feel like the, the biggest hurdle that I had to kind of get across as I started full-time software engineering was that not only were the requirements in real life not as well-defined as they had been in school, but I, I also had to get uh, past the feeling like I was going to be receiving any kind of feedback you know, like a grade that I'd gotten on a test, that that doesn't really exist in the 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 working environment for software engineering. Simply because I feel like a lot of the stuff that we work on, it just kind of lingers. It always kind of is there, and we're just continually adding on to it. Um, you know, by way of features, bug fixes, um, or really just updating the system, or or you know, maintaining what is already there. Whereas in school. Your projects are more, you know, the, the scope of the projects are is much smaller. Uh, and you're generally provided feedback uh, by way of like, you know, if it's a test, you get a grade. If it's a project, you might get a grade kind of as you go, if, as you turn things in for it. Um, but also if you're working with other people, they can kind of provide feedback uh, to you, you know, de well, depending on how your group is for group projects. We all, we all know how that goes sometimes. <laughs> Assuming you're in a good project group, you know, hopefully you're all kind of providing feedback to one another. Um, I, I, I wish it was like that in the real world, but I, unfortunately it's not. And I feel like it's, it's up to you really to create that environment and to create an environment where it's not only healthy to work in, but an environment where you're continually getting feedback on what you're doing. Because I think the worst thing that can happen is that you, you're working on something and then you think that you're going to be done with it, or you think that you built the thing that they wanted you to build, but when you show it or present it, it turns out the requirements have changed and you just didn't hear the requirements changed. I That may sound surprising, like, you know, oh, you know, how do you hear that the requirements have changed? I think you'd be surprised, honestly, I, I really do. I think whenever you make that transition into full-time software engineering, I think one of the biggest things that is you know, is, is difficult to adjust to is, is how you go about listening to meetings. Because I think meetings can sometimes be, you know, they, they can be sent out and, you know, there's a lot of people on it. But I think the unfortunate things that happens with meetings and software engineers is that sometimes the requirements are kind of discussed in a little bit of like a nebulous way, meaning they're not really well-defined but they kind of are talked about as if they're fluid, meaning the requirements can go from, you know, we we want to build feature X, but actually the requirements changed, and we actually want to build feature Y with feature with uh, things from feature X into it. So let's say we're building like a uh, I don't know some kind of engine service like we have done on this channel. We may want to you know add a enhancement that allows us to. Uh, turn up the engine speed or turn it down. But after a meeting, we may realize that we don't need that feature. Um, and we actually just want to log what the current engine speed is. But the problem with the problem with that is, you know, for software engineers, we may already be halfway to completing that feature. So now we're left with the kind of like implicit decision in, you know, in ourselves as to, okay, are we going to finish this feature or are we going to put it on hold and then complete the thing that came out of the meeting that that part is that part is difficult because it requires an action step on our part because then we have to go talk to somebody about it and we have to discuss it on stand up and we have to talk about it with you know whoever's making the decision at that time you know at to not only show what our progress is on the current feature that just got changed but then present a plan as to okay how are we going to either complete this or put it on pause to then pick up that feature that they were talking about in the meeting. And the, the other difficult part of that I should say about this is that sometimes 
people who aren't, you know, maybe as technical can talk about requirements and features as if a lot of the times they're easy to implement. And sometimes, you know, we know because we work in the system uh, that those are actually uh, very difficult to make. So it's our job to to talk about that and to say why it's actually difficult to do the thing that you think is easy to do. And that part, I, that part I think is just hard because, you know, we never had to do that when we're in school, right? When you're in, when you're in class in college and you're taking these programming classes, these system classes, you know, you don't have to like justify what you're doing. You don't, you never have to justify why you're working on the project, right? You just have to go off like what the project requirements are. You know, if you get a paper and it tells you that you need to make a weather app and you have to use uh, C++, you know, that's what you have to do, right? You have to follow the requirements. But in the real world, it's not, it's not like that. And I think that that transition can be a bit abrupt for some people. Uh, I know it was for me just because, like, I think that what happens is, we, you know, we all watch these videos and we, we get this picture in our heads of what we think that this job is going to be like. And see, it turns out to be quite different. And it turns out to be a lot less coding than what you had originally thought. A lot of it is meetings and a lot of it is talking to people. And a lot of it is just, you know, gathering requirements to figure out what you have to build in the first place. And some places you go, you know, the person who gathers those requirements, um, that may be somebody's full-time job. But some places you go, it's going to be the developer's job to do that. And that creates a lot more work on us because then we have to not only set up the meetings, but also, you know, coordinate who's doing what and figure out which features are uh, absolutely necessary to the system and what and which features are just like nice to have things. Um, that part is difficult. And I think that as you kind of advance in your, your career in software engineering, I think it'll become more and more apparent, you know, as you as you get to developer two and three and, and senior, whatever, however the, the, however the ladder goes, um, the higher you go, the more of that type of work it really becomes. Because that's, that, that is the, I want to say that's the more difficult part. I, I mean, not that coding and, and systems is, is, that part is hard too, but sometimes just getting the requirements really settled and figuring out what what are the core things that need to be built built versus what are the things that somebody just brought up in a meeting that might not be that value adding that's the difficult part because sometimes that can vary by you know based on who you talk to at the time if you talk to somebody they may they may say that you know feature a is like the 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 absolute you know best thing that we need if you talk to somebody else, they might say that feature B is the best thing we need. So how do you reconcile that difference? Do you bring them both into a meeting and discuss it? Or do you go talk to a third person and maybe they bring up feature C? So you can see how this kind of goes. And it's very important that everybody is on the same page as to what happens in those meetings and what requirements are brought up. Um, because it can't just be one person making the decision, you know, as to what feature or you know, what you're going to be building. It, it needs to be a collective understanding amongst whoever is on your team. And that part can be challenging. And I feel like, you know, moving from school where it's very, you know, you're working on your individual projects and you might have like an end of year or like a semester long group project. Um, it, it, it's it's just not like that, right? Like this, the, the real world software engineering I, I wish it was like that, but I feel like a lot of the times it's not going to be. Now, if you work, um, if you pick up just like maybe freelance, like contract type jobs where it's just like you're working on a project, you're completely by yourself, independent, then, you know, maybe it might be kind of reminiscent of what you did in school. But if you come onto a team <clears throat> at a company, it's not going to be like that because you're going to have to figure out how you fit into that whole mix of meetings and requirements and, you know, who does what and who assigns work and all that stuff. And that, that I, I really think that that is a challenging aspect of this job. And that can be 
make for a little bit of an abrupt transition from school to full-time software engineering. The other, uh, the other part of this that makes it a difficult transition, again, at, at least for me, was the fact that you are now kind of bringing money into the equation of your of, of programming and coding. Uh, for a lot of us, coding is or, or, or was a hobby, and now you're taking your hobby and making it your full time job. That can be, that can kind of make it different. You know what I mean? Like that can take something that you just did purely for fun. And now, you know, you make it something that your your livelihood depends on. And that can kind of change your, your feeling towards it. That can make you feel like, hmm, you know, maybe I'm not enjoying it in the same way I used to. And I think that you have to be ready, you have to be ready for that kind of uh, diminishing joy in the beginning. I think it's going to, your, your curve, you know, I feel like it's going to go like this. When you get out of college, you're going to be super excited to start that job. Your excitement level is going to be up here. Then as you kind of get going, it, you know, it might kind of plateau at the top there for a, a, for a year or so. But then I feel like it's going to start going down. And it's when it starts going down is when you got to decide, you know, what you're going to do. And if you want to continue and if you want to just get past that wall where you're going to plateau somewhere else. Um, and th that can be difficult because I feel like in school you know, the end is always in sight, right? Assuming that you went for four years, you know, when you're a sophomore, the end is in sight, you know, when you're a senior. When you're a senior, it's the end is really in sight. And it's hard because when you switch to full-time, uh, you know, professional work, <laughs> there's, there's no end in sight. It just keeps going. You know, you can see way out, you know, 50, 40, 50 years, and, you know, it's there's no defined end. And that can be extraordinarily difficult to wrap your head around because for the first time, you know, we, we've always been on these deadlines like, okay, you know, you finish uh, high school and then if you went to college, then you finish college and you had all these routines and schedules structured for you. Now you jump into full-time software engineering where there's no end in sight. You are now defining when the end is in terms of, you know, how long do you do this job for? And there's no, like, you know, for the first time, you have to now 100% like craft your, your, your schedule and what your professional life is going to look like. And that can be a different, you know, transition, right? That can be challenging. But it, but it adds, that part adds a, a, a new level of excitement to the whole mix because it is so open-ended uh, and you really do get to decide where you're going and what this what the journey of software engineering is going to look like for you because I really believe that it's entirely up to you. It, it's it, I, I really think that, you know, just based on the nature of the job and how many opportunities there are, and how many different way, like routes you can take and technologies you can learn, you can you can advance. I th I really think that it's in it's in all of our power to continue learning at a rate that that allows us to advance quickly. And I, I think the onus is on us to not only learn a lot as much as we can as fast as we can, and just continually reading and watching uh, tutorials and building things. Um, I, I really think that that can just propel us way off, you know, to very quickly to higher and higher spots in software engineering. And I, yeah, okay, it might not work like that and that you might have setbacks and you might realize, you know, maybe, okay, maybe the one company you're at, maybe it just isn't working out. So maybe you have to switch jobs and, you know, we all have to do that, but you know, I feel like for the most part, this this career is there's so many opportunities still here, and I, I I really think that if you really set your mind to it, you can advance pretty quick, and you can figure out what technologies you like to work with and which ones you don't like to work with. That 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 distinction there is, or that part about it about you being able to pick what technologies you work with, that definitely is a big advantage I think of you know professional software engineering versus being in school because in school 
Uh, you know, a lot of that stuff is decided for you, right? If you have to do a project in C++, you know, you have to use C++. But in the real world, it's not like that. You can generally pick what you want to work with, um, which is nice. And it really allows you to figure out which languages you actually like to work with. You know, maybe you like to work in PHP. Well, you can go get a PHP job, or you can try to incorporate PHP into your current role. And if you like to work with React, then you can get a React job, and, and, and it just keeps going on from there. So I feel like that part brings a lot of excitement, and I feel like that excitement lasts for a long time just because of how many different things that you can learn. And I feel like that really helps with the, the lack of there being like an end in sight, um, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of different there's a lot of different aspects to this, but generally the transition from school to, you know, professional software engineering, it it's it's hard, it's challenging, but it brings a, a new set of exciting things. And I feel like that time is a very that time is a very special time when you when you when you shift from school to to full time working, because that's the only time it's going to really happen. But it is where you really begin and where you really set the trajectory for where you're going to go in software engineering. I'll see you in the next one.